One of the most pivotal figures in the entire Mueller probe. The feds say George Papadopoulos unwittingly helped launch the investigation itself. He also, you may recall, was the very first person to plead guilty, and the former Trump campaign aide quickly became a household name newly unsealed guilty plea from George Papadopoulos. Trump campaign volunteer advisor George Papadopoulos. George Papadopoulos. George Papadopoulos. George Papadopoulos pleading guilty to lying to the FBI. Trump's team, however, quick to downplay Papadopoulos' role in the campaign. He was the coffee boy. I mean, you, you might have called him a, 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 a foreign policy analyst, but in fact, you know, if he was going to wear a wire, all we know now is whether he prefers a caramel macchiato, a macchiato over a regular American mm. coffee in conversations with his barista. That barista diss became famous all on its own, but you have probably seen the now very famous photo from March 31st, 2016. Papadopoulos in a foreign policy meeting with Jeff Sessions and then candidate Trump. He was telling them about a potential meeting idea between Trump and Putin. And the New York Times went on to report how his wine-fueled conversation with the Australian ambassador set off the investigation itself and revealed emails linking him to a Russian intelligence operation that was going on alongside the 2016 election. Now, in December, Papadopoulos completed a 12-day prison sentence. He struck a plea deal with Mueller's investigators for lying to the FBI. Now today, he's saying he didn't really lie, and he claims he was pressured into that deal. George Papadopoulos is here joining me for his first ever MSNBC interview. I'm joined now by former Donald Trump aide and Mueller defendant George Papadopoulos for his first ever interview on MSNBC. Thanks for coming on The Beat. Thanks for having me, Ari. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I want to get into all of it. Let's start with the meeting you took. The New York Times reporting, Miff Sood had arranged this meeting at a London cafe between you and this young woman, Olga Polonskaya, who was falsely described as Putin's niece. Yeah. And the report here is that this, and as you say, other meetings, uh, were part of what kicked off the whole probe. So one thing I'm asking you is, knowing what you know now, do you regret going to those meetings that contributed to a probe which you say uh, was a real hassle? Um, I definitely wish I never came into contact with these people, but not necessarily because of the way they were falsely portrayed um, by the FBI, quite frankly, as Russian intermediaries or the niece of Vladimir Putin. She was obviously not that person. What did Mueller's investigators want to know about what you did with what you heard at that meeting? Because as you know, there was a real crime of stealing the emails. Yep. The Russians have been found to have been involved in that, and they were wondering what? that you might know. Have Russians been talking to you about hacked emails, Russian interference, et cetera? I said no, and this is quotable. This is in my status yep. of offense. I said no, but there was this Maltese guy named Joseph Mifsud who told me that the Russians possess thousands of Hillary Clinton's emails. Now, as I state in my book, the look on the FBI agent's face was as if I was telling them the sky is blue and two plus two equals four, as if they already knew it. I'll never forget that. So I'm trying to sit there and tell them, so this guy told me this, you should look into him. That's okay, it's not that important. You're, tell us when you met him. Let's slow down there. Your yeah. contention being that you were dropping a bombshell. Exactly. Oh my God, it, this guy, Hillary's stolen emails, maybe Russian spy games link, and they don't have a big reaction. Exactly. But then, friends. so let's get into the book. You yes. Mentioned. Then you write in your book uh, that they want to meet with you without a lawyer, and you say, like a fool, you went ahead and did that meeting. Yes. And then they ask you, the FBI, we want you to wear a wire. We want you to work for us. We want you to get this guy sued for us. We'll pay you. You could be a key part of the FBI operation. And you write, what the F am I supposed to say to this? Am I a hero now? I'm just a policy guy, a networker who wants to build alliances. For a second, part of me likes the idea. <laughs> Why not go wear the wire? There was that thrill for the split second like man, who knows maybe I could be a hero and uncover something and help my country because at the end of the day look throughout my career I dealt a lot with American intelligence right. types but uh, were you worried I, I was worried for my safety um, and that I could possibly get sucked into some rabbit hole without any end in sight so you say no to that yeah I say no to that then when you look at this their desire to have you wear a wire against this person if sued that suggests that he is not on Team FBI, or otherwise, why would they need a wire for him? It could have been an entrapment operation. Against whom? Against me. But they already had you. They got you to plead guilty. 
they didn't get me to plead guilty for a, almost a year after that. I understand, initial but, meeting. but they didn't need that to get you. I mean, you you went to prison with all respect, so yeah. you know they didn't need that on you. It doesn't. Does it make sense that they would need a wire against someone if that was on their team? Look, this is a, it's a bizarre story. Uh, I'm just giving the facts now, right? Where's Mifsud now? Okay. Now, Mifsud, no one has seen him in two years. Um, so this guy who was talking all this stolen email talk, which was part of what launched the probe, no one can find him. No one can find him. I wish I could find him. <laughs> Just, you know, or I wish like something or justice. You wish you could find him, but you wish you never met him. Of course, I wish I never met this person. Um, he basically, uh, you know, tried to ruin my life, or did ruin my life for a couple for the last couple of years. I'm just now coming up for air. So let me let's go to a, a larger plane. For sure. Mueller looked at this closely. He found no chargeable collusion. Yeah. Why didn't you tell the whole truth from the start? That's um, that's a great question, um, and uh, it was foolish. And uh, I want to make it clear that I'm not disavowing my guilty plea. I served I served 11 nights in uh, prison for that. Um, and obviously my case is done with and the whole investigation is over. So are you trying to withdraw your guilty plea as some have said? So my lawyers, my current legal team, who's Caroline Polisi, who you, who you know very I've well. You've interviewed her, yes. And you've interviewed her. They're looking into options. I'm not a lawyer. Um, but you're not trying tonight to withdraw your guilty plea. They're looking at options and it's probably best to ask them that question because they're the legal team and they're the legal minds who are looking at what's in my best interest. So, legal so let's, let's help us understand this, because you can understand the people watching see you as maybe having gotten caught up in something that was a lot bigger For definitely. than what you realized at the start. Absolutely. And you pleaded guilty to a felony. Yes. And they're trying to understand if there was no chargeable collusion, why were people, including you, sir, lying about contacts with the Russians? That mystery still seems to be here tonight. Yes, and let's look at what I lied about. Sure. Because, um, and this is all public record now. I, as I mentioned earlier, I told the FBI voluntarily this guy, Joseph Mifsud, told me that the Russians possess Hillary Clinton's emails. What did I plead guilty to? The timing and the extent of my interactions with Joseph Mifsud. As I detail in my book, yep. we Can were, I put it in plain English and you tell me if I have it right or not? Sure. It seemed like you were trying to play down yep. your Russian contacts to the FBI. Is that right? I was trying to play down what I thought were my Russian contacts at the time. Understood. Yes. So you were trying to play it down. Why? Um, because I felt, I guess, uh, I failed in that mission to connect Trump to uh, Vladimir Putin. I ended up successfully introducing Trump to the Egyptian president. Um, but so I was thinking to myself, if the FBI is trying to talk to me about Russia conspiracy and the entire campaign and Trump, why would I get those guys involved when I, it was my mea culpa? Uh, dealing with this person, Mifsud. No one else in the campaign met Mifsud. They had nothing to do with him. So I felt that the FBI was really trying to en encompass the entire campaign hmm. in my mistake. So and that's, that's why I tried to distance myself. And you told George Stephanopoulos, I'm about to play it, yeah. you told him that part of what you were motivated by was protecting Donald Trump. Let's yep. take a look at that. I found myself pinned between the Department of Justice and the sitting president and having probing questions that I thought might incriminate the sitting president. You were president. trying to protect the president. Um, of course. Here we are tonight with no chargeable collusion. How does it protect the president to mislead the FBI about the contacts related to Russia? Wouldn't you have done a better job protecting him by telling the whole truth from the start? Well, like I, like I said, the president had nothing to do with my meetings with this person, Mifsud, or any of this these bizarre meetings I was having in London that I guess resulted in this crazy situation that we've been all living the last two years. So of course when the FBI was asking me about others in the campaign or President Trump invi involved, I, you know, you, it's a confusing situation. It's confusing, but let me press you on this. I'm going to yeah. read from what Mueller says and what you admitted to. This is what you admitted. Sure, sure. Deliberate repeated lies claiming 12 times the interactions with this professor occurred before you joined the Trump campaign when they were after. I want you to be honest with me tonight, because a lot of people are interested in what you're saying. Was there any part of you that thought maybe other people had done worse things related to Russia in the emails, and that's why you had to play this down at the time? 
You know what, um, and that's a really good question, and I'm gonna actually bring the facts to the table right now. Um, in September of 2016, I had a meeting with an undercover FBI asset named Stephen Halper, who actually asked me a similar question that you just did before the FBI came to my house. Mm -hmm. And he was asking me, this is all public, the New York Times, Washington Post, every newspaper around the world has documented my interactions with Stephen Halper, the Cambridge professor in London, who paid me $3,000 to understand my ties to Israel. And then he starts talking to me about Russian hacking, and he asked me flat out, is the Trump campaign colluding? What do you guys know about the Russians hacking? Is Trump involved? Are you involved? You know, we're playing 29 questions. And I flat out, categorically, unequivocally tell this person, I have no idea what the heck you're talking about. I have nothing to do with what you're describing. Neither does anyone on the campaign. So if I had simply just uh, followed that guideline, yeah. To, to were you, but, but were you worried at the time that other people may have done something worse and that would explain I don't the think cover so. story you provided? You know what? I, I really don't think so. Um, like I said, it was a chaotic interview. We're talking about a lot of different issues from uh, you know, the Steele dossier, Israelis, Russian interference, Maltese professors, the, the fake niece of Vladimir Putin, all around 9 in the morning in Chicago as I'm just getting yeah. out of the shower. So, look. So let me put yeah. it this way. Uh, <laughs> and I say this factually. I yes. don't mean this uh, disrespectfully. For sure. Do you understand why people watching this find this to be hard to believe you? Because during the probe, you were downplaying all these Russian contacts. Now there's no chargeable collusion, and people are thinking, why did you play it down? I tried to explain it. Um, I was trying to distance myself from my, I guess, stupid activities, and I didn't want to involve other people. Okay. As I explained, and that's and yeah. that's interesting. That's important for people to know whether people yeah. agree or not with every aspect of for this. Sure. You're, you're you're taking, I think, some sort of responsibility at least tonight, and so calling that stupid. Do you put? this discussion of special outreach to the Russian government during the campaign in that category. Uh, because you have Masood saying, I'm going to introduce you to the people, set up a meeting between Trump and Putin. You say that's an excellent idea. Uh, everyone remembers all the other ways that Donald Trump has proven to be quite close with the Putin government, including briefing them on removing James Comey. Uh, in, a, in a meeting that they wouldn't even let White House press in, uh, the, the famous p picture. Uh, was that also a bad idea at the time? Um, I, look, look, in fact, before I joined the campaign, I actually was very hostile towards Russia in terms of just my work at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C., some articles I've written, just conferences I've spoken at. But at the end of the day, I had a boss, Donald Trump, who wanted to have some sort of working relationship with Russia. So as I'm joining this campaign, and as I describe in the book, you know, everything seems so smooth and cool. I'm in Rome. You thought you could impress the people at that table by getting something going with Russia. Absolutely. And I've always been fully transparent right. about that, even on the Stephanopoulos interview that you referenced earlier. And even in my book, the campaign was fully aware of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, weeks before that meeting that you just saw on, that, on the TV, um, I was ref emailing the team, Sam mm -hmm. Lovis, others, hey, I got Putin's niece here. Hey, I just met the Russian ambassador. Hey, I just, even though I never did. Uh, I just met this guy, Joseph Mifsud. He's going to be our go-between between Trump and Moscow. Excellent work. Keep it going. So by the time I did go to that meeting that you saw in that picture, I was very confident. Right. You know. Let's go through a couple quick things. Uh, one, do you stand by your guilty plea? Yes. Two, uh, do you want to get a pardon from President Trump? Um, I am not asking one. I know my lawyers have formally uh, applied for one. Um, if I'm granted one, I would accept it. It's an honor. You're saying tonight your lawyers are asking for a pardon. And I, you mentioned I spoke with Ms. Polisi. I'll put it up on the screen. Yeah. She says tonight to the beat, uh, we have made a pardon application well before conclusion of this probe. Oh. So you are asking for a pardon from Donald Trump. If that's what my lawyers are doing and they represent me. Yes, that's what we're doing. Do you think you'll get one? I don't have an expectation for it, um, I, and I've actually been very vocal that I, I have no expectation for it. It doesn't change my life at all, quite frankly, whether I have it or not. Um, probably from just a an, an vindication standpoint, it might help. Um, but the president, you know, he's the ultimate authority in this country. He's the executive, uh, he's the head of the executive branch, and he has the ultimate authority to pardon anybody he wants. Um, I'm sure he's going to look at the facts. 
He's going to look at my congressional testimony. He might even read my book. And after he has all those facts in front of him, now that we know that there was absolutely no collusion, he's going to make a decision. And if he pardons me, that's amazing. If he doesn't, that's his decision. 37 people were charged uh, in this probe. Who do you think got the rawest deal between what they went through and what they did? Uh, I think a lot of us got, went through a lot. I mean, um, I guess I could speak from my personal point of view, and then I can maybe well, just for example, feel sad for Paul. Did Manafort get what, what, what he deserved, given all the crimes that he has pled guilty to that were occurring before 2016? I mean, it goes, I guess you could look at it two ways. One is the special counsel was appointed to look into collusion, first and foremost, but then he's charging him and convicting Paul Manafort on various crimes, such as FARA violations, which I was threatened to be charged with uh, formally. Um, then we have uh, bank fraud, wire fraud, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, those are illegal activities, but what was the purpose of Bob Mueller pursuing those crimes and not collusion, especially with somebody like Paul Manafort, who he had real Russian ties. I mean, he was lobbying uh, Ukrainian oligarchs close to the Russian government, yet he never found anything nefarious between Manafort and uh, the Russian government. Do you so, think Paul Manafort, through the, the total of his conduct, was disloyal uh, to both Donald Trump and the United States? Um, if you break the law, you're gonna, there are going to be repercussions. Um, I don't want to say he's disloyal. I don't know him. Um, Who got the rawest deal? You know, I'm asking because you were, uh, again, they called you coffee boy. I, I would observe you were a lower level aide. Uh, who, as you say it, as you write in your new book, was trying to cooperate with the FBI in yep. large part, uh, and you wound up in jail for those 12 days or 11 nights. Uh, do you think you got the rawest deal? Um, quite frankly, uh, you know, I'm just happy that this situation is done with. Um, it was 11 nights. The thing that bothered me the most was not being with my wife, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, that was the most difficult part. But then I also look at Paul Manafort, who's been in jail, I think, already for a year or so, or close to a year, and he's looking at almost seven and a half, eight years in prison at 70 years old. And then you have Roger Stone looking at further crimes. Uh, so I can't compare mm -hmm. who got a so-called raw deal or the, the raws deal, but well, there is a, difference. We've all, we, a lot of there us have suffered, legal, I'll say there's that. There's a legal difference uh, between some of the so-called process crimes and the underlying crimes. Michael Cohen and Paul Manafort have both confessed and pled guilty to full substantive crimes. Uh, you and some others have been caught up in what are called process yeah. crimes, and now with no chargeable collusion, the question is whether you think you or Roger Stone deserve a pardon. You're asking for one. Do you think the president should pardon uh, some of you, including Stone? As I said earlier, I have no expectation to be pardoned. Um, I've been asked this question many times, and I have the same answer. It's I have no expectation to be pardoned if I am offered a pardon. Of course, I'm going to accept it because it's an honor to be pardoned. Um, but you, you view it as an honor? I would view it as an honor um, because uh, that's the purpose of my book. Um, I think my book really is a corroborates what the conclusion of the Mueller probe was, that there was no conclusion, yet there was something else going on, and that's possibly why there might be a second investigation that looks into various other characters, uh, maybe American officials, maybe foreign officials, maybe FISA abuse. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but I was, in this congressional testimony that was released earlier this year, I was only one of the four witnesses invited to testify in front of the Oversight Committee. And do you know who the other three names were? Mm -hmm. Jim Comey, Sally Yates, and Loretta Lynch. So people were scratching their heads, why would George Papadopoulos be involved with that, the, that group? And when you read this congressional testimony, you'll see why, and I guarantee you it's going to probably open up new doors and potentially a new investigation uh, that might lead into an entire new can of worms. That's what I believe. I obviously don't have a crystal ball to guarantee that's going to happen, but um, I guess we'll just say stay tuned and uh, we'll see. Are you supporting the president's re-election? Um, I am supporting President Trump. Uh, I think he's going to get re-elected whether I support him or not. Um, I do support him uh, overwhelmingly. I think he's doing a great job, quite frankly. You worked on the last campaign as an advisor. Would you work on the next one? Um, <laughs> 
let's see how uh, America and the world kind of reacts to my story. Um, let me make sure I'm vindicated first. Um, let me support my wife first right now, who's in L.A. pursuing her career. And then I'll think of uh, potentially um, advising a campaign in 2020 or even in the future or uh, ever getting back into politics again. I'm keeping that door open. Right. For now, I'm focusing on other things. Were you surprised by Mueller's findings? Were you worried that he would go farther than this and, and indict on, on some sort of conspiracy? I, I mean, unfortunately, I know it's going to probably bother a lot of people watching this, but I fully expected that there was going to be no collusion. Um, that's why I have this book out, because um, I really had very, very hard suspicions that there was no there there. Well, because, that, that yeah. may not bother people in the sense that that means you also had faith that Bob Mueller would follow the facts wherever they led. I wanted Bob Mueller to follow the facts wherever they led. I had no issue with that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even when I was uh, cooperating with Mueller, I gave him a full access to all my devices, let him do whatever he wanted. I, I was an open book to this guy. Um, so I wasn't trying to hinder him. Um, I don't know why he was actually so harsh on me at my sentencing, while with Michael Flynn he's been so kind that something doesn't add up in that situation. I don't know what I could have possibly done more uh, than I already did. Um, but I'm glad Bob Mueller well, was Flynn, not obstructed. Well, I Flynn hasn't been sentenced. Do you expect that he'll get no jail time? Well, I think Mueller has recommended no jail time, as far as I remember. Actually, I was in, I was in prison while <laughs> I saw that recommendation. And uh, people were just like kind of nudging me, like, oh, uh, you know, I was in the cafeteria. And that's, that's the last <laughs> question before we go. Uh, what was it like for you in prison? How were you treated by uh, the other inmates? Yeah. You were not the traditional short-term inmate. Um, it was Trump country, okay? Oxford, Wisconsin is Trump country. It's a population of around 800 people. I think the federal minimum security camp I was at uh, was one of the major jobs that people had in Oxford, Wisconsin. Uh, quite frankly, I was treated excellent. I mean, uh, and you're saying the other inmates were Trump supporters and viewed you through that lens? Uh, let's say I had some street cred, meaning that by the time, by the time I got in there, George. <laughs> George. By the listen, I'm telling you. George, by the time I got, what right, kind of street cred did you all right, have? All right, I mean, you know my lawyer, Caroline. You know, she's a fighter. So by the time I got in there, we were talking about withdrawing that guilty plea. You know, she was on TV. I was on TV. We were uh, possibly. They saw you as a celebrity or as a fighter? I don't know. I don't consider myself a celebrity, but they saw me a as... A political celebrity. They, they considered me as that and uh, as a fighter. And um, that counts for street cred <laughs> when you get into a place like that, even though I was dealing with a lot of doctors, lawyers, you know, businessmen who were involved in similar crimes like Paul Manafort or, or uh, Michael Cohen. So it wasn't a dangerous uh, place. And did anything surprise you about, about it inside? Uh, I was surprised that it was actually cleaner than my university dorm and that uh, there was a softball stadium outside. It was a little too cold for me to go play softball, um, but that was the only thing that really surprised me. I was treated well and I got out and uh, right now uh, we were actually filming a docu-series with my wife about our life post Mueller, um, the uh, path to prison, post-prison. Um, and uh, just focusing on our life right now in L.A. It's, uh, we're having a great time, and we're just trying to move on and just get the truth out there. Hopefully America, you know, believes my side, and I'm not hoping they do or I'm not yeah. hoping they don't. I just want them to look at the facts, and then they can make up their own decisions, and the president himself can. And I'm uh, very grateful for your time on this show. Let me do that here as well. Absolutely, George. As you know, we've spoken to your lawyer uh, and people around you in our reporting about this throughout the entire probe. For sure. Uh, and we talked about getting you on. I'm glad we finally did here now that the probe is over. And I will mention the book is Deep State Target. Uh, George Papadopoulos, first time on MSNBC. And hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.